Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the Special Economics Seminar Series 7. And today we are very excited to have Dr. Amy Yaplonsky from um, the company called Mil Penye Biotech. And um, uh, briefly, Dr. Yablonsky received her PhD from Georgia Tech in the Department of Chemistry. And uh, before that, she was, uh, she was in the uh, University of Alabama uh, at Birmingham as an undergraduate student. After her PhD, she joined GE Healthcare as a field uh, application specialist and uh, uh, continued working there for about four years. After that company, she worked for Cytiva uh, company also for microscopy-based products. Uh, and recently around 2021, she joined uh, Miltani Biotech as a technology and application scientist. And today we will be learning more about the new special omics technologies that they have been uh, recently uh, uh, developing and, uh, and providing to the customers. And without further ado, I'd like to turn over to Dr. Yablonski. Thanks, and thanks for the opportunity to, to come here and talk. I, I really appreciate it. I hope everyone that was at AACR or participated in AACR uh, enjoyed their first time back into you know, an in-person um, conference uh, and really excited to kind of continue that conversation that you probably heard at AACR uh, with our kind of approach to you know, certain um, spatial technologies uh, that you may have heard about uh, at AACR. So, right, I'm going to go ahead and, you know, we're during today's talk, we're going to really jump into looking at, you know, immune profiling in the tumor or microenvironment that many of you may actually be really interested in, and then how being able to do this can enable certain target discovery uh, towards the end of the talk today. So I'd like to really just kind of jump in first and, you know, with the idea of, right, within this tumor microenvironment, there's a lot going on. Right, we have different uh, cell types, right? Different organization, which could lead to different uh, prognosis or progression of that. And so, there's really been, you know, as we've seen in the the previous weeks, and we'll be seeing later on in in the series, right? There's a lot of different approaches uh, to being able to kind of look at this and understand the makeup of the tumor microenvironment. And definitely, you know, I've got just four listed here with genomics, metabolomics, uh, transcriptomics, and proteomics, but there are probably even so there are other omic approaches that I don't even have listed here. But that the idea being, right, is they're all really, you know, looking at kind of the composition of the tumor microenvironment. And I certainly have been really inspired seeing, uh, you know, the talks previously uh, within this series of, you know, how, how each one of these has played a part in being able to understand that, but then it's also the combination of, of these approaches, whether that be, you know, ones without, you know, certain spatial contexts, um, or, you know, combining them with the, the idea of having the spatial context of, of the makeup of the tumor microenvironment. I mean, just take, for example, right, proteomics, where, where you know, there's a lot of um, high context techniques, right? We've got things like flow cytometry that are really great, give us a lot of markers, right, are very quick to be able to understand maybe what are the cells present in the, the tumor microenvironment, uh, but they lack that spatial context that you know, most of the people here may be interested in for this particular group, because we understand that having that spatial context of, of this environment can also play a role. It's not just what's there, but you know, in relation to each other, uh, what does that mean? And so really, you know, if we look at the, the proteomics and we're gonna, gonna spend most of the time, right, is in this, um, IHC and IF kind of um, uh, techniques. So definitely, if I think back to my early days with immunofluorescence, right, at least what I was doing in cell studies, it was really me kind of investigating, uh, you know, basically looking for a marker or two and seeing whether or not that was actually present in, in the, the system that I was looking at. And don't get me wrong, that's still really an important aspect of being able to do, say, biomarker discovery, right? We wanna know, is that specific marker actually expressed in our system? 
However, it's not surprising, much like, you know, in the, in the cell studies, right, within, you know, this looking at the tumor microenvironment, these questions continue to expand, right, and get more in depth in terms of what we're trying to ask and to understand. So, you know, now we're seeing more of these questions of where is that particular uh, marker expressed, what other cell types are really present in this, uh, and definitely, you know, going even further to saying, you know, it's not just you know, certain cell types, but what are the other cell types in proximity to that? And maybe even their functional status, right? So we wanna really understand all of these things. And that's kind of where, right, when we think about digging into the tumor microenvironment, it's no longer just, you know, which tumor cells are present. It's also the whole, you know, makeup of that in terms of other immune cells, such as B cells, T cells, dendritic cells, We've even started seeing that there are certain things like stromal uh, areas have played a big part. And so, you know, this is a, definitely one step towards answering those questions, but we can even imagine that if we dig even deeper into this, right, those tumor cells have certain, you know, markers associated with them. We may wanna see proliferation markers. Each one of these, say B cells and T cells have also subsets in certain, um, uh, statuses to them that we really want to understand. So this list can go on and on and get really long. Thus, you know, why multiplexing has become really a, a approach uh, to be able to getting into this. And certainly there are a number of, you know, different techniques and approaches, uh, especially in the proteomic space to do that. But for, in our case, our approach is gonna be based on an immunofluorescent cyclic staining. So you'll hear me, hear me refer to this as MIX for maximum imaging cyclic staining throughout the rest of the conversation. Um, and so what this in our approach here is that we are basically staining prepared tissue. So all in the, the instrument, kind of like the little schematic that you see here. And you know, whether this is acetone fixed, uh, PFA fixed or FFPE tissue, we basically stain with up to three primary conjugated fluorescent antibodies. And then we image those sequentially and record uh, along with DAPI for, for the nuclei. And we are then taking and storing those, those images and then doing an eraser step. So this is going to be done either by photo bleaching or enzymatic release before we basically are able to start this whole process again, right? So now we've got kind of a blank slate. We can choose to stain three different markers, right? For different uh, areas or things that we're looking for in the tissue. We can then image again sequentially again, along with the DAPI for nuclei, and again, erase that signal. And you can kind of see how that we then do this, uh, you know, as many times as we need to really build up, you know, the number of markers that we need for the specific scientific question that we're looking at. So this could be hundreds of markers. And again, they're all giving you that spatial information on a single piece of tissue. Uh, you know, our record has been 400, um, but, you know, this could be, again, it's not limited to just, you know, what was your scientific question and what are the markers that you need to be able to have and understand to get to the biological question or answer that you're looking for. So while this technique is definitely applicable but around, you know, many different areas of research, I want to dive deep into uh, an example looking at the tumor immune microenvironment uh, in ovarian cancer. Specifically, we're going to be talking about a tertiary lymphoid structure, or TLS. So many of you probably are already familiar with this particular kind of structure, but just as a, a quick reminder, right, our, our um, tertiary lymphoid structures consist of T cell rich areas, you know, containing some dendritic cells and B cell rich areas contained in the germinal centers, and that these really can, you know, be linked to the prognosis of certain cancer types. So if we're looking kind of at this blow up of the, uh, the TLS, right, just a general schematic here, we have, um, right, the TLS within the tumor, we have that CD3 positive zone, uh, T cell zone that would contain some DC lamp positive dendritic cells, that we said here, uh, and some other fibroblastic reticular cells, but it also is shown in here, right, in our other cells, some CD20 positive B cells, right, within that germinal center, and also some plasma cells. 
right? And so all of these cells kind of intermingle and produce antibodies, which you know can definitely form some immune complexes with tumor antigens, um, interacting with follicle uh, dendritic cells, right? And this is all going on within this this um, this structure. And definitely, we would want to understand more of this because it's the coordinated action of maybe those CD8 positive cytotoxic effector T cells and the B cells generated within the TLS, right, that can really lead to tumor destruction via either direct tumor killing um, or other methods. So in the next couple of slides, right, we're going to be taking a little bit uh, deeper look into an actual tissue sample uh, of ovarian cancer with a TLS in it. So that's here. Um, you know, definitely we can start at just looking at some general um, markers for general structural features. So this is very similar to possibly you've even done in, you know, regular immunofluorescent full color um, imaging, where we can definitely see the DAPI uh, for nuclei structures in here. We can identify the tumor, um, which is in green, which is our EPCAM marker. And we can also see some structural things like the vessels labeled in CD31. So the thing is, is that we definitely, you know, as we uh, label for CD45, we can definitely see that there is an accumulation, a massive accumulation of leukocytes adjacent to the tumor, which probably already indicates that this is a TLS. But the nice thing is, is by being able to bring in these other markers, right, we can actually look into the actual composition, right, relate it back to that schematic that we the, uh, showed you, and then also prove this assumption, right, that this massive um, accumulation of CD45 positive leukocytes um, are related to that TLS. And so we can see, right, we noticed um, from that schematic, right, we definitely saw um, the B cell germinal centers. So we can see here this distribution of B cells in this structure, right, just like the schematic. Um, which these having the CD20 uh, positive signal. We can also then look at that other zone, the T cell zone with looking at the staining from CD3, which is here in light blue. So on all of these, a reference to uh, tumor will stay green, but we can actually see that, you know, many of those leukocytes that we saw at the beginning were actually these T cells. And the nice thing is, is again, it's not that we just know that they're T cells, right? If we think back to that discussion of the TLS, right, we were expecting to maybe see some, you know, cytotoxic T cells. Can we be able to dig even deeper and see those as well, which we can. So now our lighter blue is those that are CD4 positive um, cells and the red is the CD8 positive cells. And then on top of that, right, we talked about also having some plasma cells. Could we see that in this structure? So we definitely have the plasma cells um, detected with the CD138 here in white, and then also CD38 in red. And the interesting thing that we see here, right, is that there is actually very little um, infiltration of the plasma cells within the uh, within that uh, CD45 positive rich area that we were looking at. So now we've seen kind of like the T cell zone, the B cell zone, and now even some plasma cells. But the last thing that we need to see is some dendritic cells, which is this next image of being able to look at the overlay of the CD86 staining in orange for our dendritic cells. And the other really nice thing is, is right, we were expecting some of these dendritic cells to actually be have expressed the DC lamp, um, or in this case, our CD208. And so that's what we see actually in this image is that the, the uh, CD86 is a nice membrane stain and that we can see that then not all of those po 86, uh, CD86 positive cells are actually DC lamp positive. So this is kind of expected as most of the, you know, are going to be exclusively expressed on the mature dendritic cells. So it's really nice that we can kind of see even this difference of the membrane associated uh, markers and those more in the cytoplasmic region, which is we were expecting for the DC lamp because they're mainly associated with the lysosomes. So the nice thing is, is that right, the, since the DC lamp also plays a key role in processing and the presentation of antigens, you know, this staining really can also give us a hint towards, you know, um, that the presentation of the tumor antigens is also taking place in this region like we expect. 
So we can then also bring all these things together with even other markers. So I was focusing on obviously on the TLS, um, but we can write, we've had many other, other markers in here that we can combine to see kind of outside of that, including say the myeloid cells, which I've got labeled here in C, er, CD14 in yellow, or even other structural things like this high endothelial venules um, in red here. So this is just an overlay of like seven markers, right? To kind of give you an idea of, of how you can use these multiplexing techniques to really kind of start visualizing um, certain characteristics of the tumor or microenvironment. And so, you know, this is all kind of where we lead into being able to write that picture that I was showing you actually comes off of our maximal imaging solution, which I'm just gonna spend a few moments kind of talking a little bit about um, for, this, um, for this group. And it really comes down to, right, we wanna enable basically getting into multiplexing and being able to do that um, easily so that the researcher can focus on the data afterwards, right? We're gonna talk about at the end, right? Wh what we can do more with, you know, not just seeing those markers, being able to extract actual information. And so really this kind of, in my opinion, comes down to kind of four pillars that we've kind of engineered into this imaging solution. Uh, the first being the instrumentation, the fully automated instrument. So, you know, we talked about at the beginning that in our method of being able to do the cyclic staining, this is all done on the instrument itself. So this does all of your staining, all of your washing, right? All of the imaging with the integrated liquid handling and um, microscope. So really all you have to do is kind of design your experiment, right? Add in the, your particular samples, um, and the antibodies that you want to stain for uh, that particular piece of tissue, you hit start and then walk away. This is really enabled by two other uh, pillars that I'll call them, right, uh, within this, for this solution. One being the actual sample carriers that come with the instrument uh, itself, right? So whether you do need to do acetone, PFA, or FFPE tissue sections, these can all be prepared on your own slides. And then basically we can clip on these, these carriers for tissue sections to be able to do all the staining and washing in them. Uh, and the really nice thing is that these come in different sizes. So say if you had two pieces of tissue and wanted to stain them uh, differently to kind of look at the differences um, in that uh, with different panels, right? We can also split those up. But the other really nice thing is, is that we, it's not just the tissue sections. If there was a question that also required you looking at certain cell lines um, or suspension cells, we also have the capability of doing the multiplexing within the instrument uh, with these other uh, consumables as well. And the other portion to this, right, it's, it's not just that we can definitely, you know, prep your sample, put it in the instrument, but also giving you and enabling you to be able to get to those markers, right? So if you were interested in, in looking at the uh, um, a tertiary lymphoid structure, right, being able to give you the, the, the reagents to also be able to investigate and probe those. So that's with our validated antibodies. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper into this particular aspect uh, of the platform. And this really starts with kind of, if you're not familiar with Milton E. Biotech, right? We obviously also do a lot with antibodies across all of our other platforms as well, our flow cytometry um, and other things as well. So really, if you kind of think of it, Milton E. Biotech is really invested in having good, a high quality recombinant antibodies, right? That's kind of the bread and butter of what we're doing. And these were commonly engineered antibodies really, you know, kind of come down to giving us a lot of advantages that we would want to see uh, when doing this kind of multiplexing technique. First, you know, we definitely have a really superior lot uh, in within lot consistency. Um, if anyone has worked with the reaffinity antibodies before, you would you know this. Um, from, from your experience with those. We also, um, it allows for a lot of reproducibility of the data as well. And additionally, we have minimal to zero background due to the inclusion of a mutated FCR region. So this really prevents any non-specific FCR binding or receptor binding and really eliminates the need of use for FCR reagents. 
The other really nice thing is, is that if you remember back, right, from our approach of being able to stain, image, and then erase, is that we know that these particular uh, um, antibodies have fluorophores that are erasable. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that there are actually two different techniques that we can employ for this particular method. We can do either photo bleaching or a fluorochrome um, release. So many of you are probably familiar with already the photo bleaching um, idea, right? So we've got our uh, antibodies that we've kind of, again, stained on the piece of tissue that we are interested in. We're able to image those, and then we flood the system with light, right? And we are able to basically quench the signal from those fluorophores of interest. We then take an image of that, uh, knowing what that, you know, if they're any residual in, uh, information or signal is there uh, and then move on to the next uh, cycle. However, we also have these fluorochrome releasable uh, or these releasable um, antibodies as well. So you'll see these kind of in our portfolio as uh, redialyse or uh, release antibodies. And the really nice thing here is, is that, you know, these uh, specific signals, right? Same way, right? We're going to be staining our piece of tissue of interest. Uh, and then, you know, collecting that information, but then we end up adding a proprietary enzymatic uh, reagent and are able to kind of uh, disrupt the backbone of that and be able to walk or wash away, right, the fluorophore uh, or, or the entire antibody. And again, we've done a rigorous testing of this particular uh, for our releasable or uh, antibodies, right, to make sure that we actually are releasing the entire antibody. And so this now primes that the sample again, ready, we will record what, if there is any residual information in there and then have it ready for that next uh, cycle. The really nice thing about this is that a lot of times, you know, there's a question of whether or not, you know, am I really kind of um, tied into one particular uh, release mechanism uh, for these. And the nice thing is, is that you can actually use both mechanisms in one experiment. So if your particular, um, you know, question really needed to be able to release an entire um, antibody, right, we could combine that with other reaffinity uh, photo bleachable um, antibodies that we have in our portfolio to really design the, the correct panel um, for what you need to do. So the really nice thing is, is right, we already have this really large portfolio of high quality um, recombinant antibodies, but I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that everything in our portfolio obviously would work with our multiplexing. And we realize that a large portion of being able to get into multiplexing is actually being able to have, you know, reliable and optimal antibodies to be able to stain for what you're looking for. And so that's kind of where the next, I'll say like the next step comes in within the validated antibodies, right? We have done in-house a lot of the initial work of validating um, antibodies within our portfolio for specifically the mixed technology. So if you are, you've been on our site before, maybe bought some of our flow antibodies, you may have also seen the designation mix on there indicating that these have also worked with a uh, you know, specific uh, fixation um, uh, condition, right? And can be used within the platform. So the really nice thing here, right? Again, we wanna make this, this kind of this, I guess this, this entry, right? A, a little bit easier for people is that we offer a pretty extensive an antibody portfolio within just that mix um, validation. So if we're looking at it, we have um, you know, approximately 500 antigens across human or mouse um, specific samples. And then we also have looked at uh, different several clones right within each of those antigens. And so that makes up approximately 800 um, compatible clones. And that when you think about being able to, right, we wanna stay in with these different fluorophores that we can um, detect within the system, right? If you add on the conjugation to the different fluorochromes um, of FITZ or PE or APC, you know, this makes a total of approximately 2000 fluorochrome conjugated, primary conjugated antibodies that you can use already in the mix experiments. And it's, we also offer a variety of, of kind of, I'll say, formats, right, in which this can be used. 
So the antibodies can certainly come as individual files that are, you know, again, you know which ones are going to work in the system. You can decide to maybe, you know, test a couple out by just taking from the vial, pipetting the right concentration that you'll need for your specific experiment within a, a deep well plate, a 96 well uh, deep well plate. So this really gives you the flexibility to kind of play around with combinations of different antibodies that you may need for your particular, um, uh, you know, question that you're looking at. The other flip side to that is you can also purchase these ready to use dried down antibody plates. So these particular plates, they're again a 96 well plate in which the antibodies have been dried down and then sealed off. And then all you have to do is again with your sample, right? Just place these into the actual Maxima itself. Um, and all the other, you know, mixing, staining, all of that is automatically done within the system. So, you know, the really nice thing about these RIA screen plates is that they're great for if you're looking at, say, RIA screen max, which is all of the antibodies that we have validated for a specific fixation method, right, to kind of get a very broad approach if you're not sure what you're looking at. So it's very easy to just pop in there. We're also going to have um, uh, customizable panel um, specific plates also tailored to your specific individual experiment. So the nice thing here is, is well, we get the flexibility to try a couple out in the vials. Once you have that panel down, right, this is a really easy way to get the same panel over and over again and just basically uh, change them out, right? Change out the sample, change out the plate uh, to be able to start really producing a lot of that information uh, and really minimizes the operator time, uh, and again, lets them focus on the actual data coming out. Now, obviously I've spent a lot of time talking about really the nice aspects of kind of having this antibody portfolio, right, for, for users to ready kind of um, be able to engage with and be able to use in their thing. But we also recognize, right, we're not gonna have every single antibody, especially maybe for some of these specific disease states that you're looking at. So I like to also mention that it's not, our, our platform is not only limited to the antibodies and, and the things that I'm talking about here, is that we are also a open platform in the sense that we have, you know, you can add in um, any of the other primary conjugated antibodies from other vendors or that you've made yourself. We provide you all of the validation protocols to be able to implement this. And additionally, we have the capability within the first couple of cycles, if you really you know, have a clone that works best in an indirect method, we can also build that into the panel. So it kind of gives you the breadth of what you would need to, again, we understand have all these different questions, um, right, about the immune profile in there, but also certain disease states that, that a researcher would want to look at. And so that's kind of the three, you know, beginning portions, right? The what I'll call like the lab portion of being able to really enable you to get your your samples in there and get them imaged, right, and get them stained with the specific uh, antigens that you're looking at. But I think the power really comes in the analysis, right, of what can be extracted actually from that imaging session. So you know. We really, if you think about the TLS that we were talking about at the beginning here, right, we actually want to turn that multiplexed image into actual information that we can, you know, quantify or talk to other researchers about. And so the really nice thing is, is right, we're taking, you know, it's the Max IQ view analysis software is certainly a great viewing tool, right? We can see all these different markers, you know, layered on top of each other to really kind of dive deep and in deep into it, you know, zoom in, kind of look at all of those different, um, different areas within the tissue. But the really nice portion of this is the, is the rest of the, the kind of the pipeline that I'm going to talk about. First being the actual segmentation, right? So this is that single cell identification of, of the cells that you're, you're interested in, right? So, you know, in the Max IQ view analysis software, you know, we're able to have multiple algorithms using more than just a histogram intensity based model. So this is really nice because we can customize a couple of parameters, right, to be able to kind of optimize um, the segmentation of those individual nuclei and then the cytoplasm. But the other thing is, is right now that we've enabled being able to have all these other markers, 
in the in the actual um, panel, we can then also use those uh, multiple biomarkers to really in the segmentation algorithm as well to overcome a lot of challenges that we've seen in cell segmentation, such as like really dense areas, um, irregularly shaped nuclei, right? So it's really enabling kind of everything that you can get out of the actual image uh, to be able to also help your segmentation. From there, right, once we've been able to identify all those individual cells, we have 80 uh, plus cell and biomarker based measures, right? So if we do have irregular cells, we definitely can look at size, shape, size, roundness, thing, or uh, nuclei roundness, things like that, but also biomarker expression um, and other kind of things like kurtosis and skewness uh, that maybe other people that have worked in high content are familiar with as well. So it doesn't end there, certainly, right? We could take this information, um, export it uh, in a CSV or an FCS format, right? If you've got a bioinformatics pipeline that you wanna put it into. But I think the nice thing is, is that within the, the analysis software itself, we can actually start doing a lot more of this, this um, higher level information as well. So we definitely can classify um, certain cell types or regions. So we have the ability to do either a just 1D histogram to be able to do um, kind of a gating strategy to say these are positive, these are not positive. But we also enable these 2D scatter plots as well. So anyone that's worked in flow may is very familiar with these. So if we want to be able to plot, say, two expression markers against each other and see the population that is doubly positive, we can also enable this to be able to really get into our phenotyping. And then also what we'll see later is chain these together uh, to really get down to the cell type that you're looking at. And once you've done this, right, it's taking either a high level approach of just saying, these are all my cells. I wanna be able to do some dimensionality reduction. So we definitely could do TISNI or UMAP in here. Um, also K-means clustering. But then also we can then start also using things like heat maps or distance plots to be understanding, right? If we've phenotyped these particular cells, now can we ask questions? Are there certain other uh, signatures or markers within these cell populations that I haven't thought about before that were in my panel? Um, or, you know, can I say the spatial relationship of, of certain cell types with each other? And I really think this is cool because this is really kind of a, it brings it full circle, right? Because all of these dots that we're seeing in this, in the, the scatter plot down here, and then also in the TISNI, right? These are uh, individual cells, right? And that we can always bring it back to the image to either verify what we're seeing, right? Or take a deeper look. Um, so I think it's really nice that it kind of lives in its own ecosystem of, of keeping and retaining that spatial context and always bringing it back to the image, but getting that quantifiable data out in the end. And so I want to dive a little bit deeper into, you know, the, the types of information that we can extract, right, being able to have this analysis portion um, to all of this, right? So if we really want to go ahead and start looking at key aspects of the tumor microenvironment, you know, the first thing that we might want to do is actually localize those cells. So obviously we talked about the TLS previously, and I was just showing you markers, right? And we were making conclusions about, you know, I definitely see these and these, and they're definitely in this general area. Um, but we can actually even take that a step further and, you know, use that single cell segmentation and some other information, uh, you know, about the system to be able to localize where these actual cells are. And so the other example that I'm kind of show, um, in the schematic here, right, is looking at tumor, tumor infiltrating leukocytes, right? So these are leukocytes that are able to infiltrate the tumor region, and they really kind of are one example of an important population, right, that we would want to understand their interaction with the tumor cells. You know, we know that they are going to play key, you know, key players in terms of tumor reduction uh, or growth and, and also progression. So we really want to be able to not just see these, but also localize these and make some conclusions about uh, their uh, location amongst the tumor. And so that's what I'm showing here. Um, so this is actually a colon carcinoma example. Uh, so just like the TLS, we can visualize certain markers of interest. Obviously, you've got a lot in here, but what I'm showing is, again, blue, the darker blue for the DAPI. Um, we've got EPCAM now is actually in red, so this is going to be our tumor marker. 
And then the leukocytes, which are in cyan. So that's kind of the underlying um, image here. And so, you know, very similar to how we saw the, the, you know, we're saying, okay, well, we see the leukocytes, right? Well, now, because we've enabled the single cell identification, I can be able to say those that are CD45 positive, right, are my leukocytes. And then I don't even have to stop there, right, because I want to understand the relationship with the tumor in EPCAM. And so based on its proximity, right, the, the leukocyte proximity to the actual tumor cells, I can then further classify these as tumor infiltrating leukocytes or non-infiltrating leukocytes. And so this is just kind of a zoomed in image, right, where we have the pink or the magenta, uh, which is the non-infiltrating. So we just see these with the... Um, with the CD45 um, signal. And then those that are in close proximity are the ones actually in green. And so this is really nice because this can be also easily translated. And you know, here we're talking about tumor infiltrating leukocytes, but this could also be translated to other um, things of interest that people are looking at. I know that stromal associated cells are, are definitely another thing that people might wanna look at. Right, so you can identify, say this was stroma versus tumor or, stro or something other region of interest in here. So exactly the same, right? We can definitely identify a certain population uh, and then say where that is in proximity to a specific region or other um, area of interest. And the really nice thing is, is that we can take this even a step further, right? So going back to, in the previous example of looking at the tumor infiltrating leukocytes, we were just looking at CD45 positive and saying, you know, and then making uh, kind of decisions off of that. But, you know, as we kind of seen right from the beginning, again, our just like basic schematic of, of the tumor microenvironment, it may not just be that we want to understand leukocytes, right? We want to understand a specific subtype or status of that. So if we just think about it, right, we may want to dive deeper into any of the immune cells. So T cells or macrophages, natural killer cells. We may want to understand further the fibroblasts and the tumor cells. And then also, you know, a, a big area of interest, obviously, is immune checkpoint markers and differentiation. So these are all things that we would want to be able to really harness the power of being able to do multiplexing and then extract that information. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you an example with tonsil, I mean, which, which we probably have all seen multiple times and have looked at. Uh, but this is a really great example of a piece of tissue that's going to have lots of different cell types in it. Uh, so definitely we could have looked at anything. We could have looked at, you know, the different um, uh, B cells or macrophages within the tonsil. But for this particular, you know, really diving deep, we focused on understanding the T cell subsets that would be, uh, a, you know, inside of tonsil, uh, um, inflama inflammatory tonsil tissue. So here on the left, right, is the kind of a general strategy of the marker expression that we were following. Certainly we can do the typical CD3 positive is T cells, um, but right then we're starting to actually dive deeper into each of these different ones, right? We can look at T helper cells, so being CD3 positive and CD4 positive. We can certainly look at cytotoxic T cells with CD3 positive and CD8 positive. But then we can also look at all these kind of subs, what I'll call subsets of the, the uh, T cell helper cells, right? Um, and so we can also use markers, right, within the panel to really get to each one of those populations. So within our panel, I think we ran 35 markers here. We focused on 10 of them, right, just for the T cells to be able to do this. And this is really easily created within the analysis software. Right, so we can certainly start using scatter plots that again, we would be familiar with starting with something very broad and then daisy chaining them together to be able to mimic the, the uh, schematic, right? That I'm showing here on the left side of this um, and, and really then also localize them on the image. And so I'm gonna show you an example of that in the next couple of slides. So first of all, definitely we can see our CD3 positive, CD45 positive cells. Um, that's this greenish color here overlaid on uh, the DAPI signal of just some tonsil tissue. Uh, and so this is really a great, you know, starting point that this can be a, a base unit, right, for kind of then being able to start defining these other populations. Obviously, a very common one is looking at the T cell or 
T helper cells, which are in purple. So these are going to be CD3 and CD4 positive or the cytotoxic T cells, right, with the CD8 positive. So that's in the red here. So you can see how we've just, you know, easily just taken one step further to phenotype from the CD3 uh, positive T cells into another population. But I think the really, really cool thing, or I think is really cool, is that it doesn't stop there, right? We definitely want to, right, we talked about all those different helper T cell uh, subsets that we would love to look at and define. And that's where we can kind of get to that, you know, bottom layer that we were talking about of looking at regulatory T helper cells, right? And then also memory effector cells or naive T helper cells. And so that, you know, using that, we can even see those particular um, cell types again on here. And the really nice thing is, right, we're quantifying this as we're going through. So where we started with a large portion of the T, just T cells in here, right, we can see that we're breaking down these subsets into smaller and smaller portions, but that are very important a lot of times when we're trying to understand, you know, um, certain progression, let's say. So one example is, you know, we talked about that colon carcinoma and definitely seeing those leukocytes and let's say we take it a, further, a step further looking at the T cells, um, knowing the activation of those T cells would have been really useful, right? So we know that CD8 positive T cells are associated with favorable prognosis and high levels of the T regulatory infiltration is unfavorable. So you could kind of imagine being able to take that information of what we localized before and then combining it here and really being able to start really deeping, diving deep into uh, these different um, particular uh, immune or the, the environments. And then the last portion of this is, is like, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about being able to visualize them and definitely see them on the image. But I think the, the other portion to this is, you know, what everyone's really interested in, right, of being able to spatially map where these cells are, right? We got a little preview of it with the colon carcinoma by saying, you know, is it closely approx or in close proximity to the tumor cells or not? And so I actually have a couple more examples where we can really dive into different ways of being able to use, you know, that spatial context and mapping the different um, distances uh, to be able to get more information out of that. The first example that I'm showing is actually, you know, in uh, this is in uh, breast cancer. So we've got here just a couple of the cytokeratin uh, labeled, right, to identify our, our tumor region, right? So we're going to have that defined as our tumor region. We can then use that kind of same strategy that you saw before, right? We're going to just say that our CD3 positive cells within this um, uh, CD3 positive, CD45 positive cells are going to be our T cells. And we can kind of, again, map those as well. So up to this point, we've definitely seen, right, being able to localize these. But the next really cool thing is, is that I want to, you know, for this particular example, we were interested in, you know, what are some maybe some key uh, signatures of cells close to the breast cancer uh, to, or the, the tumor region um, versus far away. And so we were able to kind of then divide that up, right? Say, I want to be able to make these, these different zones. And I have ones that are very close to the tumor region and then those that are further away, right? And, and kind of make these zones that you see here, um, starting with the red being the closest to the tumor. So white's going to be the tumor, red's the neck is the closest, and then working our way up to the blue being further away. And so we can see that, right, kind of overlay that with the image, right, we definitely still see our tumor region in the white, and then the T cells now have been color coded for these different zones that we've identified. And the nice thing is, is that because now we have these T cells identified and in their different zones, we can start looking at different signatures that may be associated with that. So creating a heat map of the specific markers maybe that I'm looking at and making some observations here. So what some of the things that we noticed is that we had our CD8 expression was actually lowest in the subset away from the tumor cells, indicating that those closer were likely going to be um, cytotoxic, uh, CD8, um, cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells. But then on the flip side, those T cells that were closest to the tumor actually showed an increased expression in CD45RA, but a decrease in the expression of CD5RO and HLA-DR, meaning that those that are actually here are likely naive T cells and not actually activated. So again, using the information in that spatial relationship to start making some, some interesting um, conclusions. 
But, you know, kind of bringing this all together, right, that was just showing you how we could definitely take certain zones and, and, and maybe uh, look for certain signatures, right? We, we're not sure what we're looking for, but we can also then kind of use our capability of being able to phenotype certain cells and then make conclusions of the distance between those uh, specific cell types. So this is an example from a lung edema carcinoma. I don't have a lot of the images here. This was part of a, um, a webinar uh, that we, we hosted. So if anyone's interested, we can definitely send you that way so you can see kind of the full breadth of what was done with the uh, lung adenocarcinoma data. But what I'm kind of focusing on here is the different distance mapping that we've done. So here in green are the tumor cells, uh, and then the red is the T cells and the macrophages in yellows, and then the fibroblasts. So this was all in one piece of tissue, um, right? And then if you're, what we're showing here is all these kind of other webbing, I'll call it, is the distance mapping. Um, so that which is really in the darker is actually closer to those particular uh, uh, phenotypes that we're looking at. And then the brighter it is, the further away it is. But the nice thing is, is sure, we can definitely see that, but we can also then create certain heat maps like this, looking at the distance, right, amongst each of these uh, specific phenotypes that we identified. So of course, across the diagonal, right, this is going to be the closest. So it is this dark purple color. So if you're looking at the heat map, we've got the dark purple being the closest and then the, the dark, the red and the dark red being the furthest away. And so the really nice thing is, is now we're able to start making relationships, right, between the things that we're looking at. We can certainly see uh, that, for example, you know, we've got the macrophages uh, that seem to be closest uh, to the tumor area, whereas the T cells are actually the furthest away. Um, so, you know, and that, again, this is just one example of what we can do once we've phenotyped and have that distance mapping and putting that all together. So... Uh, in the remaining time, I just want to quickly show you now that we phenotype, we localize, we can spatially map, how do we pull this all together in target discovery? So in the example that I'm going to be talking about today, uh, some of you may have already seen it. Uh, this is from our, our particular paper looking at CAR-T cell therapy discovery in, uh, in pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And just to kind of give you a little background, this particular PDAC attributes to around 85 to 90% of all pancreatic cancer cases. It really is a devastating disease with the overall, um, you know, overall having poor survival rates. And there's really little effective treatment routes out there right now. And so that's kind of where, you know, CAR-T therapy has started to kind of look into being able to be a viable uh, therapeutic option. Now, you know, these are definitely been somewhat um, useful, but in specifically the PDAC model, there are, you know, there's some clinical trials going on looking at specific targets, but there's really a lot of varied uh, efficacy and outcomes from that. So specifically kind of the basis of, of what was being looked at in here was being able to find targets that had the tumor specificity, but then also limited those off tumor expression, right? So we have those, uh, we limit the off target effects. Um, and so that's what this study was all about. Now, there's obviously a lot going on in this particular um, uh, paper, which again, it, you can go to the QR code to be able to get that paper and look further. Um, but I'm just going to kind of take you through the general um, flow of things, which was not just to use the mix in, in you know, alone, but also combine this with other uh, proteomic approaches to be able to really get to the end result of, of making the CAR T um, and then also testing that in, in certain models. So Kind of the, the workflow, you know, first was the identification of specific and safe targets. And then the back end was to generate those and then kind of understand um, what those were. So in the first portion uh, where there was a lot of materials, so they had a lot of uh, 17 xenograph models. So they had a lot of, you know, material to work with here. So they were able to start with a, a flow cytometry screen. So dissociate the xenograph and then be able to put this through flow taking the number of markers that they had of interest, which was 371, down to 50 particular markers that they thought would be interesting. And so the nice thing was, is that when they finally wanted to move into these primary PDAC models, right, which they had much less tissue, right, so you're not able to use flow cytometry for this, they were 
able to use the 50 markers that they found in the flow cytometry along with 50 other markers kind of for spatial location and things like that uh, within the, the uh, mixed technology. And so from that, and along with doing some other flow cytometry verification, they came up with four specific markers of interest and were also able to look at that in healthy tissue and kind of, again, get to that point of looking at the off-target effects and then do, uh, right, generate it and then move on to the validation of that. So here is just kind of, a, a again, a overall of, of the imaging of all of that, which you can kind of, again, see like all the different images that you can get out of it. But again, the really important thing is, is that by doing this single cell identification, right, they're able to create a heat map like this where they have, uh, and look at specific areas, right? So this was uh, the, the kind of the tumor cells. So if you're not familiar with this, this is the, uh, the expression of the specific markers. And then across the, the columns here, this is one cell um, in each one of these little lines. And so for the tumor region where they've got high expression, obviously in some tumor markers, but they also wanted to see a, a expression of a target or a marker that would be high in tumor, but not high in immune cells. So they, again, were able to kind of take all that information of the imaging, condense it down into these, uh, you know, uh, two-dimensional clustering and looking at this heat map to be able to identify certain uh, markers. And the nice thing is, is that because this is all tied back to the image, right, we can certainly see those that would be, you know, register as not tumor specific and then tumor specific, right, in these, but you can also go back to that as well and look at maybe some that you weren't sure, right? So we definitely get the advantage of looking at the morphological information, but also the spatial information. So, you know, CLA might've been an, a target of interest um, because of the possible secretion here. So it's nice to have those images and go back to them as a verification of what you're seeing in that dimension, um, that 2D graph that we showed. And so then you can also, so we, they were able to get that down to four particular targets. Right, and then look at that in uh, healthy tissue. So this is just three of them, CD66C, T-SPAN8, uh, and then CD318. So I'm not gonna go much into it uh, due to time, but you can see that of these targets, sure there might be some other um, areas, but that for the most part, we're looking at a, a very minimal staining in other healthy tissue. And so they were able to then generate these CAR-T cells um, and uh, of the markers that we were talking about previously, the differences here would just be the linker length of the CAR-T. And so you can definitely see in the bioluminescence of the actual tumor reduction or, or not, right, in the mice themselves. But then you can also see that graphically versus the mock, um, you know, in, in this particular cell line. Now, the one thing that I just want to point out, right, was that there, you know, from the work up to that, we thought that CD66C and CD318 would be very similar in their efficacy. But what we can see, right, from this graph is that the CD66C really didn't have an effect on the tumor growth or the tumor reduction. And so that we can really dive into why was there this difference in that particular um, um, uh, result that they said they saw. So the first thing you can definitely excise this and then and then um, section it and look for the actual CAR T uh, infiltration, which is going to be labeled in the blue, the LNGFR. So we can see obviously in the CD66C, not a lot of the actual infiltration of the CAR T, but definitely lots of um, cytotoxic T cells. But then it's not only that, right? We can also look, is their tumor even actually still there? Are there macrophages? And again, the other nice thing is, is, is was this due to possibly downregulation of the CD66C um, being induced on this particular um, treatment, which they definitely can also verify that while there were definitely differences, it was not due to the downregulation of specific markers. And so with that, I know I'm coming close to time. So here are some other applications if you're interested in. Um, we've got a poster also on glioblastoma characterization in target discovery using some of the same principles. Um, and yeah, I will, uh, happy to take any questions. Yeah. Thank you, Amy, it's a lot of data. <laughs> Very yeah. impressive. All right, uh, so if, Anyone has question, you can actually unmute yourself and ask. We try to make this uh, seminar kind of very uh, interactive, engaging, formal. So feel free to unmute and ask. Uh, otherwise, you can also put it 
uh, your question in, uh, in the chat box. Yeah, maybe I can uh, start with um, uh, one question first. A lot of people are still thinking their, their own questions. Uh, so in your uh, image analysis, um, so you have you have very densely packed the cells, right? So uh, how did you kind of segment segmentate the cells? And uh, maybe you have done that quite well and fully implemented in the software. Just uh, um, uh, you did <laughs> kind of describe the details in your talk. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, for the segmentation of really dense cells, mm -hmm. right? Which tonsil mm -hmm. we've also done um, looked at thymus as well, right? It when you have those really dense cells, it's hard to do just on the DAPI signal alone. And that's where I think the really nice um, aspect of the software is, is that, you know, there are other markers that I can add, right, that are cell, cell membrane markers, right, that should divide those nuclei. So I can add those into the, to basically help the algorithm know when to split certain nuclei. Um, there are also some other, you know, sensitivity, uh, and obviously, if, if you're familiar with the, the segmentation, like size parameters that we can play with as well. Um, and I think the really nice thing is, is that instead of using it as a hard threshold, uh, the software is kind of smart to use those as starting boundaries, right? And then add on these other other markers that we may have in the in the panel to kind of almost like I'll say loosely, like learn, right? That that this is where I should be splitting these nuclei. Right? And obviously this is all like visual feedback. So you can, you know, try a couple of parameters, try adding in um, other markers maybe that you have uh, and, and that you have in the panel uh, that you've imaged uh, to really refine this to the point um, that you get most of the cells segmented um, individually. So I see, uh, Josh, you have your hand up. <laughs> Hi, Amy. Thanks for the thanks for the talk. I'm uh, Josh Tillow from the Welcome Leap uh, Delta Tissue Program. Um, I was kind of curious about two things. I guess one to do with the platform. So I'm curious if um, if Meltini, uh, pro provides profiling services with the technology, or if you're only sort of distributing the technology. And um, the second question is: uh, Have you benchmarked this against um, maybe Talk, which would look like the um, sort of the closest comparison? So yeah, so the first question of whether or not we offer this as services, we do not currently, um, and I'm I'm not part of any of those uh, current discussions if that is going to be a thing. So I'll just leave it as no, we don't have it right now. Um, and then we haven't benchmarked that against other particular platforms that I know of. Um, I know that we are obviously looking at also benchmarking against certain things like IHC and things like that, but I don't know of like other multiplexing um technologies right now. Yeah, uh, I think in your T-cell uh, subtype analysis uh, pipeline, uh, so you were able to kind of gate, for example, CD4 cells and then CD8 cells and uh, within a subset of CD4 cells, look at sort of naive memory, central memory, effector memory and uh, uh, effector cells that so that that that's how you're kind of um, very much like a full cytometry gating, but you are getting mm -hmm. direct uh, in um, uh, on the images, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when you when you plot those different uh, um, CD4 cell subsets, so uh, you, you for example, if you show uh, Fox P3, um, but you are you already remove the Fox P3 expression from any other cells, or you'll have Fox 3 p 3 sort of across all different cell types there. Yeah, so, so depending on how you, you chain them together, right, mm -hmm. um, you definitely can exclude, right, Fox p 3 from, from anything else. Now, that's not to say if you are expecting it in, say, again, not Fox p 3 but some other kind of marker in other cells, um, right, we can also do a different method, right? Like if we know that mm -hmm. we want to start there, uh, with with a particular marker, say again, just for an example, Fox P3, we can kind of gate first there and then kind of do the subset. So I think for the strategy we did, right, that was excluding Fox P3 from from anything else we were looking at. But there are definitely ways to change the um, the classification 
uh, if for other markers that if you wanted to kind of start there, you know, it's going to be in multiple cells, but then so use that first and then kind of say, okay, well, it's positive in FOXP3 or whatever marker, but now I want to see those subsets. We can, we can do it that way as well. Uh, indeed, that's basically the reason why I ask, uh, uh, because that would be super interesting if you're looking at, for example, CDA cells and uh, if you can see some FOXP3 positive CDA cells, then uh, those cells are way more interesting. <laughs> Right, right, exactly. And that's, I mean, that's like the nice thing about combining kind of like the heat map, right, of just like all say T cells, and then say, okay, is there, you know, we can look at it in the individual cell and even pick out, say, um, if I do the heat map with Fox P3, and then say, okay, well, it may not be a larger portion of the population, but I do see these individual cells, right. And then between the, the classification and seeing that in my heat map, right, really dig into those and and be able to, to localize those as well in, in my gating strategy. Okay, there's one question in the chat box um, from Ian. Uh, so do you have recommendations for mitigating autofluorescence on this system? Yeah, so there's a couple of things that we do with autofluorescence, right? I mean, you saw that we did the, the lung edema carcinoma. Lung has obviously a, a ton of autofluorescence. Um, so we do do a autofluorescence quenching, and I, I say quenching in the sense that we photo bleach the whole tissue before even starting. We can also do multiple photo bleaching steps as well um, without perturbation of the system. So that is one way we can combat that. Uh, and then there's also, you know, definitely has the capability if researchers are already familiar with using other, um, uh, you know, methods to combat photo bleaching outside the instrument, or sorry, uh, autofluorescence outside the system, they can definitely do that. And then just start with, uh, again, our instrumentation will do that initial understanding of what the autofluorescence looks like in the system, we will then bleach it. Uh, and then take images again, so we know what the bleached autofluorescence uh, image looks like. And then it also is taken into consideration when it's doing the background subtraction in the images, right? So I think one thing, an important thing to notice in this is, right, even though we're doing this cyclic uh, um, system, right, and I talk about doing the erasing, you know, another important aspect of that is we're also monitoring what that what that looks like after the photo bleaching or after the enzymatic release as well. And so this is all built in to also the, the um, pipeline of, of the processing uh, before you get to the analysis. I hope that answered the question about how, the different ways that we, we work with autofluorescence in the system. It did, yeah, thank you very much. So you um, image uh, a bunch at the beginning after you've bleached and then um, in between each cycle, you also image after the bleaching yes. um, so that you can do background subtraction on the next round? Mm -hmm, exactly. Okay. Yeah, to, to image like a 100 markers, which you describe, or 400 markers, I forgot which one, number you mentioned. So how long does it take? Yeah, and so that a lot of that depends on like the area, right, that you're looking at. Um, you know, something like a TLS, right, you may need just a smaller area. Um, if you want to do whole tissue. So, so this really ranges to like an overnight kind of couple hour run to a couple days, again, depending on, on the actual area. Um, and again, the number of markers. To so do 400 markers is, is a lot. I, uh, I have not done personally 400, but I've done 100 um, on a good size portion uh, and it was a couple days, so. Yeah, 100 is already super, super impressive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and the nice thing is, is, right, this is, it's all done in the background. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm actually running something right now in the lab, not having to be there, because I think a, a, more, a good portion of my, at least my time when I finally get these images off is, you know, diving into what am I looking at, right? I mean, yeah. we have like 60 That's markers, right. but what does it mean? Yeah, as long as you can kind of walk away to come back yeah. and just see the data. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, so any more questions from the audience? Okay, uh, if not, uh, thank you very much, Amy. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you uh, for this fantastic talk. And uh, so I believe next week, we're gonna have uh, Diego from uh, Luna for to give us um, 
uh, seminar about multiplex immunofluorescent imaging as well. And I hope to see you guys uh, back next week and uh, uh, have a good long weekend. <laughs> see you guys. Thanks.